thank you very much, Karen. That's a very kind introduction. Um, hello, I know some faces, and I hate to say old faces, but I'm getting old too. <laughs> I was here at the University of Florida from two, no, 1997 to 2013, so you know, 17 years, and I was very um, fortunate to be affiliated with TCD. So, like Karen ex explained, my research has been largely basic biology, ecology of tropical forest and tropical forest plants. But uh, I really learned a lot uh, through my affiliation with TCD. And uh, when I moved to Kyoto um, in 2013, I was very curious about, say, my current home institution, like uh, Kyoto University, um, is working. I had some idea, I kept some, you know, communication with my colleagues in Japan, people who worked in tropical forest, doing some basic research, as well some applied research. But I have to say, a lot of the things that I was learning, and I have learned since I moved to move back to Japan, um, are not really available in English literature. Japanese scientists and the people who actually are active in overseas development field, they don't necessarily publish in English. So uh, you may not have heard a lot, and I was surprised how much diversity is there. So uh, actually, the so next slide, actually, I'm going to get to do this. Uh, yeah, I see, I see, I see, I see. But this should work, just a sec. So, my first question, icebreaker question. How many of these logos do you recognize? I said this is Kyoto University, this is Graduate School of Agriculture, Kyoto University, so these are clear, but how many do you recognize? They are 10 You recognize C4 maybe? You recognize maybe APDC and its new logo? Um, C. Shambana Tropical Botanical Garden? JICA. Okay, great. JICA, Japan um, International Corporation Agency, which is the you know, equivalent of USAID. And they have, you know, um, research grants uh, that is sort of more action-oriented research for SATREPS program, which is similar to what NSF and USAID do. Uh, and uh, this is always important. They often do uh, this is uh, GIFPRO, uh, that's Japan, um, I, I will explain late, later. This one, anyone, any idea? A, C, B. ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. And, um, and anyone have any idea about what MAFF is? Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries of Japan. But um, they all these different, you know, agents and institute, and these two are Center for Southeast Asian Studies of Kyoto, which is very similar, kind of parallel to Center for Latin American Studies of UF. So UF and Center for Latin American Studies have a very strong tie to Latin American countries and do a lot of, you know, uh, sociological, biological, interdisciplinary research. As CSEAS, Center for Southeast Asian Studies. They are very similar to what Latin American studies do here. A lot of students and faculty members, former students, uh, they go to different, you know, Southeast America, I mean, Southeast Asian countries, and some of students are told, oh, don't come back for two years until you become fluent, live in village, come back. Something similar what some of you may have done. And um, so there are a lot of parallels. And uh, CER, Center for Ecological Research, they have done a lot of research in, say, Lambia National Park, uh, looking at canopy research and biodiversity research. Okay, can't wait. So what am I going to talk, um, tell you today? Did I do something wrong? No. Who's back? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Jeffrey. Where's Jeffrey? Jeff Holly. Okay, all right. Oh, so I was surprised. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> uh, so, so <laughs> 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 we witnessed to Jeffrey, but uh, what I wanted to tell you is some first-hand account of witnessing deforestation fronts in Southeast Asia. 
because working with new sets of students, some from Cambodia, or Bangladesh, or Indonesia, I get to travel to these countries, actually witness uh, before uh, statistics uh, come out uh, that what's really going on down there. For example, Cambodia says to have more forests uh, than some other surrounding neighboring countries. That was true 10 years ago, no longer. It's changing so rapidly, it's shocking. Um, but I also thought, well, many of you may be interested also in about Japan and its own history, how the sustainable management and uh, socio-ecological you know, uh, landscape in Japan may have emerged. So I want to tell you a little bit, something I enjoy rediscovering and relearning about Japan, its own history. After being in the US, I have a fresh perspective to actually appreciate some of the historical trajectories as well as our own tradition in Japan. And um, so I want to also tell you some of the, I'll come back to these logo things, organizations that are engaged in tropical conservation development in Asia. And some Japanese government for Kyoto University and institutions and some other international networking organizations, as well as some more action-oriented organizations. Oh, going backwards. So this is a very brand new paper that came out on science, 14th of September. And this is red parties where deforestation is happening very rampantly. So tree cover loss map. Based on the um, Google Earth Engine, and Global Forest Watch, which is supposed by World Resource Institute, Institute, is very, very important because now they can use this fancy Google Earth Engine thing to actually see um, large scale as well as regional with very high resolution image for free. It's incredible what they can do. And so this paper, um, Flux Find Drivers of Global Forest Loss, uh, it's really excellent paper, gives in big perspective. And so 27% of global forest loss can be attributed to deforestation through permanent land use change for commodity production, whether it's soybean production or oil palm production, but this is a very important statistics. Next is forestry, which is a mixed bag because uh, forest can recover. So there may be some trees being harvested, but there may be recovery of it. But anyway, they can see this has changed 26%. Uh, as Jack and Claudia have been discussing over years, degradation is, of course, important in this uh, topic. Shifting agriculture, 24%, but depending on what kind of shifting agriculture. And wildfire. And so, so, so they use the you know, fine, detailed Google Earth Engine map. These are some examples of commodity-driven deforestation, shifting agriculture, forestry type of um, deforestation <coughs> pattern. They can tell the pattern. They have this sort of elaborate algorithm and modeling to actually determine with good probability what kind of uh, reasons may be behind each type of deforestation. Wildfire shows different kind of map pattern. Urbanization shows distinct pattern, etc. Urbanization, by the way, is responsible only for less than 1% of the deforestation directly. Of course, we are not talking about indirect ones like consumption or commodities, etc. But directly, it's only 1%. And when they classify, what are the primary main drivers of forest cover loss for each grid cells? Commodity driven deforestation is very heavy in Brazil, soybean, um, and then here is Borneo, Malaysia. This is definitely the oil palm. And shifting agriculture is important in Africa, perhaps because of widespread of dry land. Uh, this is important because shifting agriculture of displaced people in more marginal land result in more permanent forest cover loss. Actually, this is important issue. I'm also currently involved in IPCC, Intergovernment Panel of Climate Changes, special report on climate and land change. And this is very important issue that worldwide climate change scientists are also aware of because 
land use change, not only it um, involves people's welfare, but it has a feedback to climate. And cultivation of marginal land, especially dry land, there is a greater risk of permanent loss of vegetation, permanent loss of arable land. So this is very, very important issue, climate land use interactions. So from that perspective too, this is very interesting. Uh, forestry is important in Europe, North America. Canada is still losing a lot of primary forest, and Japan is very green. We are 60 some percent forest covered nation. Large part of it is 24 plantation. I'll come back to that. But they have this distinctive pattern of harvest and regrowth. Wildfire is important in Canada and Siberia, etc. As I already said, purple dots are rather small as a direct cause of deforestation. But the regional, this kind of regional difference, this is a Monga Bay summary of this recent paper, really nicely written. Um, so, Southeast Asia, which is uh, my focus today, has a really uh, uh, large part of deforestation due to commodity um, driven deforestation like oil palm plantation development. But <coughs> um, green part, forestry, tree harvesting is still important. So, that's, uh, and also this is historically changing issue. So, light yellow or light brown, Brazil, the peak of deforestation is past, but in Southeast Asia, it has grown quite a bit. Between 2010 and 2015, there's a huge loss. And this is what I saw down in Cambodia in 2015. My colleagues writing book about Mekong River region and forests and people's livelihood. It's a book published in 2008. They said Cambodia has relatively low level of deforestation. 2015, that's no longer the case. So that's what I meant by rapidly changing um, scene of forest conservation. So this is what I saw on the ground, Kampong Tong province, which is a flat area used to be covered one of the you know rem, you know small remaining large tracts of forest that's what people are writing in 2007 and so i had a road trip with my cambodian student and the forest administration person and we are going to visit some of the forest monitoring plots well we arrive at the forest monitoring plots and this is what we see so one hectare out of a large how many hectares whatever a forest track gone. The fact that it's forest, you know, a monitoring site uh, is often completely neglected. And what happens is uh, they may be turned into huge cassava field or rubber plantation. And often what we see are small peasants. What's happening is um, economic land concession. This is a sort of a government's encouraging development and they give land to small holders if they stay for five years but after five years and scraping whatever they sell land to large industrial scale operation of cassava and rubber all over and uh, so so this is the track that forest administration i draw this is my student well, we saw some fragmented forest but this is supposed to be a nice chunk of forest, but instead there is a sign that says, oh, this is a forest monitoring plot, and with a fund from USAID, not USAID, um, JICA, etc. Totally ignored. Here is a corner post, here is a max tree. <laughs> That's it. So, so Cambodia's back. Uh, so this is what I saw at Laos border. Laos, China border. So the trucks are lining up from Laos going into China. This is back in 2012, so it's a little bit earlier. I had the chance to go to Laos border and I was astonished by lines and long lines. There are about 50 trucks carrying tree stumps. So they are literally digging up tree stumps. 
big, big trees. From the look of it, these are all native tree species coming somewhere, Laos, and so going into Xishambana, and what do they do with it? They make tables and chairs in hotels and houses, luxury furniture made of natural gnarled wood. So I wanted to see what's really going on. I suspected because Chinese side in Xishambana, we saw rapid increase of rubber plantation, what could be rubber, but I wanted to see what's going on in Laos. I got to see it, oh, sorry, where is the picture is? Sorry, I think there is a mix up. I got to see it uh, this August, just like uh, a month ago. I went to Laos and it's not just uh, rubber. A rubber plantation is really spreading rapidly. And, but also important is a teak plantation. Sometimes they are not really planted at the right place. Teak trees, I saw some miserable spindly ones, as well as some nice ones. But there is some money going in. Money comes from Vietnam and China. So it's international capital that, you know, bringing big equipment, buy some rights to harvest trees, and literally, you know, entire land. They don't waste anything. They dig up trees all the way from root, transport to China, try to squeeze every possible. There's no possible chance of recovery if there is a large scale conversion of this site. Uh, so, Japanese government is um, kind of, you know, um, aware of this issue. Japan itself has been a long time accused of being a main importer of tropical timber, which is still true. Um, but, but also, Japan, along China and many other countries, developed countries are important drivers of tropical deforestation because of commodity trade. So, uh, so this is important issue. So each biodiversity target, etc. Japanese government is aware of the importance of biodiversity conservation and carbon storage, etc. But we need to have private sector to collaborate. So this is actually uh, quite amazing. I went to this um, January symposium and was impressed by some of the uh, talks. One of the most impressive one is this one by Global Canopy Program, Executive Director of Global Canopy Program, uh, Nikki Forrest Mardas. He talked about this amazing um, program called TRACE, free open program to use publicly available information to supply chain transparency and traceability. So for example, here is a little bit of Brazil, sorry, it's not easier, but he wanted to say how much it goes to Japan and where it's coming from. So with this, you can trace importer, exporter, and municipality. So deforestation that you see this corner of Brazil, who is actually ultimately responsible? This is incredible. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention, one of the most uh, amazing thing I heard during this uh, symposium, but it's good that um, Japanese government, along with some other, you know, um, policy makers, are aware of the importance of um, supply chain. Ah, sorry, the slide got mixed up. This is the Laos side. So the Laos side, you see some rubber plantation. Teak was flowering. This is about a month ago, and literally creeping up, you see big patches of deforested land. So that's, um, that's where all these tree stumps came from. It's a shame because from a biologist, ecologist viewpoint, these forests, mountain forest zone in Southeast Asia is really important cultural heritage of East Asia. Um, sort of um, oak, and the um, Loraci dominated uh, forest and it has very high diversity. This was, this is in Taiwan, but there is, it's just a belt from southern part of Japan going through Taiwan and the east coast you know, of China and down to South Asia. We still find a lot of new species. So my um, colleague at Kyushu University using DNA barcoding 
and Flora is still a mess. You go there, try to document, and if you go to some of the established forest monitoring plots, you find a new species of oak. Not like a miscellaneous little insect, it's big oak tree, but these new species, we still have such things here. And these forests are going and gone in many places. And turn into fancy furniture in Chinese hotels somewhere. Now, but the local people are there. And they have used the products from forests. This happened to be the one in South China, um, uh, Guangxi region. Lots of oaks. It's really amazing heritage. And that's turning into these kind of mosaic patches. Yes, shifting cultivation is still going too, along with large scale change. This is a flight landing to Guam Prabang in Laos. So, so like I'm um, summarizing the last five, six slides, global and regional movements of money and commodities drive deforestation and permanent conversion of land use in the last remaining forest in mountain regions of Asia. Plant region had been gone, <coughs> long, uh, but the last frontier, Cambodia, Kampontam region, I think it's getting deforested completely. And remaining forest front, remaining large chunks of forest in mountain region are very severely threatened as we speak right now. And uh, so what's happening is traditionally forest dependent the indigenous minority groups are losing their traditional livelihood, clearly that's the case. And the subsistence and lifestyle with small scale slash and burn on forest based resources too, they are trying to hang in by switching to commercial crops. So international students studying in Japan from Myanmar <coughs> often tell about how people are changing from small scale subsistence slash and burn to tea plantation. They can sell tea, not necessarily for international market, domestic markets too, economic growth, urban lifestyle, more purchase power. People are switching from subsistence to um, commercial crops. It's interesting. Um, students, my students, um, uh, interviewing local indigenous group in Cambodia, in mountain region. He found that, oh, where do they get firewood? From cashew plantation. And um, so governments may be coming up with community-based forest management, but they don't necessarily do equal. So depending on different racial groups, some of them are not given enough land to actually make living community-based forest management, but where do they get firewood? Not from their community-managed forest. They go to cashew plantation. It's really twisted and complicated. So it's kind of interesting to learn all these things. So yeah, I mean, people here all know slash and ban is not slash and ban. It comes in different ways. This is Japanese slash and burn scene in mountain forest in Japan. We are after all within the same cultural zone from Southeast Asia to Japan. And uh, this is a nice way to keep sustainable livelihood in mountain region without cultivating rice. But more than slash and burn, this came from Wikipedia. Uh, thank you, Wikipedia. But <laughs> <laughs> Bolivia, Sumatra, Chiang Mai, Madagascar, large scale uh, slash and burn by displaced people, if not promoted by something like economic land concession in Cambodia style. Oh, but the traditional slash and burn, so I'm gonna switch gear to tell you a bit more about my rediscovery Japan part. So people, not all rural people in Japan cultivated rice. After all, 80% of Japan is here. You can't grow rice. So what did they do? They did slash and burn agriculture, and they grew, uh, you know, Japanese barnyard millet, foxtail millet, soybean, and azuki beans. And uh, so these people um, didn't depend on rice, and they stay in mountainside. They may be hunting, they may be making charcoal, they may be uh, engaged in different kinds of uh, livelihood. 
And so I enjoy reading about this ethnicology of Japan, traditional uh, rural life, uh, lifestyle. But I'm not alone. A lot of ecologists in Japan are interested in sustainable way of um, own traditional way of life. So World Satoyama became very popular about 20 years ago. Sato means village, Yama means fields and mountains. And uh, it kind of translates to uh, socio-ecological landscape. Japanese government liked it, uh, knowing that it needs to be promoting more environmental, sustainable way of living. And so they thought, huh, the old way of living is great. People live in harmony with nature and maintaining biodiversity, etc. And they thought it fits the all the SDG ideals, etc. This is a kind of landscape that you might enjoy seeing if you come to Japan. Traditional village, rice field, surrounded mountains and hills. Just the images. Sometimes you see terraced rice fields. Definitely beautiful. North of Kyoto, actually, three hours from central Kyoto. So the idea of Satoyama is like this village, people, home garden, farmhouse, crop field, rice paddies, pond, grassland, some river running down and bringing water, nutrients, and grassland for feed. And then there may be bamboo thickets, there may be pine thickets, there may be some plantation, but there is a back, uh, less disturbed natural forest for water sources. And there may be some sacred forest around shrines and temples. This is kind of ideal image of Japanese sort of original landscape. Um, of course, it's hard to maintain this with change in demography. <coughs> there is a shift of population from rural areas. So it's very hard to maintain this. Anyway, so there are the various definitions. Narrow definition is really secondary forest, just the secondary forest people utilize near where they live, but broader definition is image I just showed you, entire set of landscape. And the expanded definition is really the way that some people promote it, but I think it's a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, but how did this landscape emerge? I got curious and started to read more about the history of forest management. Forest management in Japan got established more like 300 years ago, totally independent of Western forestry tradition. Prior to Edo era, during Edo era, Edo era is the time when shogun ruled Japan and closed Japan from the rest of the world. The Japan borders was closed to the rest of the world, no Western influence, very limited trade, only some Chinese merchants and very limited Dutch merchants could come to just one single port. So, during that era, all the local lords, rulers, had to go to the capital, which was Edo, once a year. Going this way, coming back way, they had to elaborate very expensive, you know, procession. And uh, it's definitely one way to uh, keep the local lords' financial status rather limited because they had to spend so much money. So central government was doing this trick. But this image is like, okay, there is a long procession going to or uh, coming out of Edo. And then Japan opened the port and the situation changed. So these are some of the um, sort of very rough change in period. And then World War II. So forests were starting to be exhausted even before that. This is a sort of a little drawing from 7th to 8th century in Nara, which had the very first capital established in 740 something. And what you see are sort of hills and some trees are scattered, but largely disturbed naked slopes and some trees. Could it be exaggeration? But I think uh, we already know that uh, for building temples and shrines, they switch from the most valuable timber to less and less valuable because they exhausted less one first and switch to next and next next. So forestry being selectively logged and getting exhausted, 
But whilst population grows, then that means a lot more dependence on firewood and everything. So Edo government was established just about 1600. Before that was Civil War era. There are some other governments, but this is population of Japan estimated over time. Edo era resulted in peace and prosperity and population growth. However, it did stop. Remember, Japan was close to the rest of the world. So it has reached its carrying capacity, ecological carrying capacity. Uh, this is incredible. When Japan's became flat, like ecology textbook. <laughs> During this time, there are lots of um, natural disasters and famines. So 12 million to 33 million, and it became more or less dead stop for remaining 150 years until modern government started and opened the port and started import, export, exporting silk, importing iron and technology, and Japan's its population skyrocketed. We would blip at the World War II, and, but it recovered and it has hit the peak population in 2004. Now it's rapidly declining. This is population trajectory of Japan. Um, sorry for the background all in Japanese, but what's happened during this time is very interesting. During this rapid population growth, forests disappeared because people had to use wood. Well, during wartime, these people didn't want to stay up late because some bandits may come and attack you and people kind of like and was hiding and ready to always prepare that time to a peaceful time. And the people would dig up the pine roots, burn it, and do something so that they have something to sell. Um, so Kyoho, middle of Edo era, 300 years when Japan was closed, bad weather, cold summer hit, especially Western Japan. This is the time of little ice age in Europe too. And 10 May, bad weather followed by multiple big volcanic eruptions in Iceland and Japan, followed by El Nino hit Northern Japan really hard. Lots of people died of starvation, farmers included. And temple, these are some three major natural, um, not, I mean, big famines induced by natural disasters, but it was compounded uh, by lack of resources. People are very clever. They had some farming food. This is horse chestnut. You can make a rice cake. The tuba of this semi-toxic lily can be eaten, and people had these as emergency food resource in rice fields. When the rice crop fails, they depended on these to survive. Forest-based products, that was a very important way of surviving. Sweet potatoes and corns as a new crop have been introduced by trickle, but then spread like wildfire, like sweet potato. Uh, speaking of pine bark, people ate pine bark during farming time. Okay, bark has some sugar and stuff. So if you pound it, you get some nutrition out of it. By this time, forests are becoming exhausted. The local laws and governments are very worried. So what did they do? They restricted access by peasants to remaining forests. However, they opened these forests in case of famine, so that people can go in and peel off pine bark and somehow survive. Uh, but um, overall, during the peacetime, Agriculture meant loss of forest, cutting forest for shifting cultivation, permanent cultivation, settlements, etc. And landscape became modified. That was true during the Edo era. So this is the kind of scenes of Kyoto. You can see some scattered pine trees, which are very resistant of shallow acidic soils that are over harvested. Natural vegetation is different. Now, no one collects firewood. Surrounding Kyoto is covered by evergreen broadleaf trees. Some people say, hey, this is a cultural landscape. We are losing it. But with the back, very few trees, if any, just, you can actually you used to be able to see scattered pine trees, no other trees, because people are over harvesting trees. 
around the city of Kyoto at the time. Uh, end of Ed era didn't really help either. Um, the local people are still exhausting forests and hills. You see one single tree. This is photography. So you can tell. Yes, people cut forests completely, dug up roots and pines and everything. So this is from the Meiji era. So it's like um, 1890 or so. So in Japan, too, this forest transition happened more great agricultural production and population increase and the forest go and gone. And the shifting from small scale shifting, I know, um, shift, I mean, slash and burn agriculture to large scale and then sometimes collapse. What happened in Japan during this time was a lot of, I said that natural disaster was compounded by loss of forest because there are a lot of landslide, sedimentation, river had a river that higher than the surrounding area, very frequent flood, and all the sun that you know eroded down from the hills down to the beach turned into thick sandy beach and uh, all that sand was blown by wind and burying fields and houses. So during this time that's when the Edo government at the time when Japan was going downhill about here they came up with lots of rules and regulations. I said local government regulated access by people except for the time of planning. Of course it was kind of um, top-down samurai dominated government and once it became peace forests kept on going down in Meiji era. Well then Japan became industrialized and uh, went into war, World War II, invaded China and lost and all that stuff. Uh, forests got really damaged. Um, the harvest did for uh, war effort to support war effort. So 1945 is end of World War II and after that however government worked really hard to restock forests. So this is a trajectory natural forest remaining natural forest for the entire Japan and the plantations. Good statistics but you can see forest has recovered and right now to I mean about two thirds sixty percent of Japan is occupied by forested land but about two thirds of it is artificial conifer plantation of pretty much one single species sugi which is a very fast growing cedar forest administration promoted this as the most ideal timber because it goes straight rapid the problem is these trees are ready to be harvested and uh, uh, these stands could be reforested to have a nice healthy cycle of forest. No, it's not working because cedar price is too low. It's not worth harvesting. Labor cost is high, there is no market for it. So we have lots of useless forests with very low diversity, monospecific cedar plantation. Serious problem here. Um, so I have talked about Japan. Now I want to talk a little bit more about. Okay, so back to some of the international networking issues. So answer to some of you already knew C4 Center for International Forestry. Um, as Karen introduced, I'm on board of. Um, I mean the board of trustees and. Um, one of the center of CGIAR, you know, um, agricultural centers, and all involved in you know um, development in developing countries. But um, C4 as well as ICRAF, these are the two centers that have something to do with forestry and forest management. ATBC is increasingly trying to be more relevant in this rapidly changing world. Particular Asia Pacific chapter has been holding annual meeting for the last 10 years and um, it's uh, doing its very hard work to foster capacity building. A very important player in this is Hishiyambana Tropical Botanical Garden. They hosted some ATBC meetings, local as well as main meeting, and they also have this uh, tropical I mean, conservation ecology center and it's very, very important. So China can be a good force 
we have to remember that. But also China's leading through the supply chains, some of the major tropical East Asia deforestation. ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, this is actually an intergovernmental center with headquarters in Philippines. And it's coordinated multiple efforts for conservation and sustainable uh, use of biodiversity within ASEAN region. I think this is important. Developing countries themselves, governments, are more pro trying to be proactive. So um, one thing I observe is in Southeast Asia, there are certain NGOs very active for conservation efforts, conservation of biodiversity. But I think uh, they tend to be dominated by Americans and Europeans. So it's more top-down. Conservation projects may work when there is money for the project. Once project is over, it just all evaporates. But I think we need to have ASEAN governments becoming having more economic power and more interested in their environment and biodiversity conservation. I think it's very important to be in partnership with them. Each government has good force as well as force for development. The economy and money is the highest priority in some branches of government, other branches of government may be caring for environment. How do we actually help this good force within you know, uh, China? or Southeast Asian countries. Very important that I keep on thinking. I don't have a good answer. But and the Kyoto University has been trying to be part of Good Force along with funding from Ministry of Agriculture, Forest and Fisheries, Japan International Cooperation Agency. And this one is interesting one too, Japan International Forestry Promotion and Cooperation Center. They actually um, have contract to actually implement projects funded by JICA, et cetera. And Kyoto University itself has multiple research centers, many people in different branches working in um, tropical forest and the more um, integrative sustainable development topics. Recently, because we are so scattered at so different you know, centers, even within Kyoto University, about 30 faculty members across 11 units decided to create this uh, Kyoto University Tropical Forest Conservation Social Sustainability Research and Education Unit. We wanted to have a cute one, so it's KU3. <laughs> the website still doesn't have good English, but um, this is our effort to create something like TCD here. The Center for Southeast Asian Studies have been doing something that Center for Latin American Studies have been doing here, but I think we need to have a bit more coordinated effort and, and continue meeting some new interesting researcher, right, at the uh, Kyoto University campus. Oh, it's just a you know, big university like UF or Kyoto University has so many people. It's hard to actually be working today. You often don't know what person next door to you may be doing. That's often the case. So, but we are trying, and I'm trying to be bridging some effort. So even though I don't do really action-oriented conservation project myself down on the ground, I try to coordinate this kind of effort. And so the um, International Symposium, I think Jack and Claudia were in this one. This was in 2015 and 2018 at another one. And, um, so trying to, you know, coordinate networking and trying to keep up with the changing scene in conservation ecology in uh, tropical Asia. So I think I have talked all my slides through. Oh, I just wanted to mention, uh, we have, the, this is Kyoto University Graduate School of Agriculture. That's my unit, which is very much equivalent of UF ICAS. And, uh, we have exchange MOU for uh, exchange of faculty students and scientific materials. So I'd like to make a good use of it. So I'd, like, I'd love to exchange some ideas and potential uh, projects. Student exchange, this is a great deal. If you are a UF student, you can go to Kyoto University and participate in classes or collaborate with other people without paying tuition and the university does help, you know, take care of your visa and uh, staying. So we want to have sort of a balanced exchange. But 
I hope I convinced that uh, we have a lot of researchers working in Southeast Asian countries. So if you're interested in working in these countries, or well, some of you are from Indonesia, I see some faces from Indonesia here. If you are interested in collaborating with some other people, you know, researchers, experienced researchers in Japan, uh, please let me know. I may be able to find the right person, depending on whether you're working in wildlife or agricultural, forestry balance or whatever. So tuition and fee exemption is attractive part of it. So you have to be a full-time student in your home institution to get this exchange deal. So that's, um, I think this may be the last slide. So um, maybe I'll keep this one over. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I think I want to, I think I have a little time for questions, right? Yeah, great. <laughs>